Okay, let's see a few more examples <coughs> regarding the uh, system response, system magnitude response, uh, actually. So this was our first example. It was a poor man's uh, low-pass filter, you can say, <coughs> with only a single pole, and the distance from the pole um, increases, as you see. Let's look at what's happening, at least uh, visually. If you're somewhere around zero, then the distance to the pole will be minimal. As you go further away from uh, the pole, by increasing the frequency, or by uh, increasing the frequency in the negative sense, then uh, the distance will be uh, growing. Therefore, uh, the response will decrease as omega goes to infinity or minus infinity. At omega is equal to zero, it reaches to a maximum. And if you precisely draw this thing, you will have something like this h of j omega it will reach to a maximum. What is that maximum value when omega is equal to zero? One over tau square, square root will be one over tau. Uh, one over tau over one over tau will be one. So it's one and it will just decrease as frequency increases, something like this. <coughs> as omega goes to infinity, this thing goes down to zero converges down to zero. So it's sort of a low pass filter, we can say. Now let's see a second order system. The first order system was this. Uh, a second order system is described by two exponentials. Like this, e to the c2t, u of t. So the impulse response produces a combination of two separate exponentials. And when you take the Fourier, uh, the, sorry, Laplace transform of it, <coughs> it will be uh, like this. First, let me write it uh, in the compact form, then I will explain the parameters. Omega n squared, which is a scale, by the way. It's not omega that I'm writing. S minus C1, S minus C2, which can equally be written by expanding the denominator to a, a quadratic formula, A squared plus. Now, I'm going to write it in terms of the parameters. 2 lambda omega n S plus omega n squared. Now you understand what omega n really means here. Omega n is c1 times c2 square root. So let's write it like this. So omega n squared is c1 times c2. Uh, and here in the first expression at the top, h of t has an m, uh, which is a scaling magnitude. That m is omega n divided by 2 lambda square minus 1. And with respect to lambda and omega n, c1 and c2 actually has um, a better explanation. c1 is equal to minus lambda omega n plus omega n square root of lambda square minus 1 and c2 is minus lambda omega n they are the roots of this second order polynomial in, in the denominator we know how to find the roots of a second order polynomial right these are the roots minus omega n square root lambda square minus 1 <coughs> <coughs> sorry now, uh, <coughs> these parameters may look awkward, but uh, they are historically done like this. And you may remember them from circuit theory, circuits and systems. In the second order systems, uh, these lambdas, 
correspond to quality factors and things like that, or from electronics courses, if you have seen them before. So historically, since uh, circuits and electronics people were dealing a lot with second order systems, they just specified some of the parameters like omega n, lambda, etc. Uh, now, if uh, let's split this into two cases. If lambda is greater than 1, then lambda square will be greater than 1, and inside the square root it will be a real value. And that, due to that real value, we will have C1 and C2, two poles that are real. This is, let's assume, uh, somewhere uh, minus lambda omega n. Okay. Around minus lambda omega n, in the uh, positive direction and the negative direction, it splits into two because one of them is plus omega n times a constant, the other one is minus omega n times a constant. So with a symmetric distance to the right and to the left, we have two poles like this. And uh, if you try to plot this behavior, it will behave uh, like a low pass filter, basically. Because, again, the distances to the denominator uh, co coefficients, which is this pole and this pole, so this v1 and v2 will be minimized at omega is equal to zero. As they increase upwards or downwards, the distances will grow. So the denominator will grow and it will turn down to zero. So it is another low pass filter we can say in this way, if lambda is greater than one. When lambda is precisely equal to zero, if that parameter is equal to zero, then it becomes a double pole at minus lambda omega n, where lambda is also moving to the right. Because if lambda is zero, then lambda times omega n is also uh, it will also be uh, zero. Therefore, these two are moving to the right and their gap is decreasing. You can say. You can say it like this. <coughs> uh, sorry, uh, yeah, yeah, okay. I'm sorry about that. As lambda goes to not zero, excuse me, I'm confused about that. Lambda square will go to one because lambda square minus one is going to zero. So as lambda goes to one, these will again move to the right, towards right, but they will meet at some point which is minus omega n only. Minus one times omega n. It's not gonna be zero. So this minus lambda omega n will be minus omega n, somewhere here, let's say. So lambda is equal to 1 will be, this will be minus omega n. There will be two poles on top of each other. If lambda is between 0 and 1, what will happen? Is the place where things become uh, interesting. Because lambda will be a smaller entity, okay. So uh, this minus lambda omega n, the center point, will go further to the right. It will be nearer and nearer uh, to the center. But uh, the other two terms will start becoming imaginary. So those imaginary things will be in conjugate pairs. One of them will be plus an imaginary, the other one will be minus an imaginary. Is that okay? So they will be somewhere around here going up and down. Two poles. One of them is going up, the other one is going down. And they uh, have a trajectory going like this. When um, lambda is exactly equal to 
zero, then it will be uh, it will reach to its peak somewhere here. Then lambda will be equal to zero, so lambda times minus lambda times omega n will be zero, and this one will come to the conjugate of that. So this will be a trajectory. That trajectory can be drawn in and in control systems. Uh, you will be drawing these trajectories. So first they start with two separate poles. Then they meet here and from there on they start splitting with, by changing numbers, upwards and downwards. That is the uh, trajectory of the roots. And in the control theory they call it the locations of uh, the roots uh, and location comes from a Latin word, uh, word uh, and the uh, it has a singular and a plural form the singular form is locus and uh, in control systems they use it like that they call it root locus how do the locations of the roots change the poles are the roots of the denominator so this is a sort of a, an introductory conceptual introduction to uh, the root locus phenomenon, which will be quite popular in the second semester's control systems theory, if you haven't taken them already. So uh, let's consider these two cases. Sorry, I, I'm not intending to plot a zero. Let's only consider those two poles, is what I mean. And when you try to draw uh, the phenomenon, or, or what they really look like, they look like this, in terms of the magnitude of h of j omega. Something like this. <coughs> By the way, uh, these are the frequency peaks that we have along the j omega axis and they are of course omega n square root 1 minus lambda square and minus of it minus omega n square root 1 minus lambda square they are the peaks of this bandpass looking system it's not really a bandpass system because it is also passing the BC. Uh, but it's amplifying some of the frequencies. It is emphasizing some frequencies, these two frequencies that we have here, which are omega n square root 1 minus lambda square and minus of it at the right, uh, left hand side. So this is a bandpass filter, uh, a, a very poor man's bandpass filter, op it can, which can be obtained by a second order system. And the bandwidth. Since, as I said, second order systems are uh, very much investigated by the electronics people, uh, they analyze them perfectly. The bandwidth is known to be 2 lambda, and the quality factor is known to be 1 over 2 lambda for this kind of a system. I'm not very much interested in these parametric uh, details of this thing. Uh, I'm more interested in what the shape really looks like and the system response is what the shape looks like. This is it. You don't need to quantify what the quality uh, factor of this bandpass filter is or what's the bandwidth of it. It behaves like this and that's it. That's the only thing that I care. Now the last example regarding the system response it's again in, an interesting thing and in uh, exams I ask similar questions um, and it is this h of s is equal to s minus a over s plus a what kind of an h of t does it correspond to? can you find h of t from here? Yeah, you just need to say it that it is s over s plus a minus a over s plus a. a over s plus a or minus a times 1 over s plus a is a first order system. What is s over s plus a? It is s times 1 over s plus a. 
One of S plus A you already know. What happens when you multiply it with an S? Yes, the time derivative. So you have to take the time derivative of a first order system and whatever you get will be there. So I hope you will be able to find the inverse Laplace transform of this thing as well. But uh, what is more important is not in the time domain, it's in the Laplace domain because the system response evaluated from here will be quite interesting. It will be uh, like this. There is a zero at A and there is a pole at minus A. Now consider a frequency omega here. What is the di distance to the zero? What is the distance to the pole? Yeah, whatever they are, they are the same. This is the same as this one. So, uh, magnitude h of j omega will be a constant times n over d, which is the constant itself. And when you try to draw it, h of j omega in magnitude, it will be a constant. Do we have a name for such systems? All pass. It is an all pass system. Why do we have all pass systems? What may be the purpose of them? It doesn't. It doesn't make really sense, right? Because if it's an all pass system, just attach it to a wire and make it an identity system. An identity system is an all pass system. That is, h of t is equal to delta t. The impulse response is the impulse itself. But that's not an identity system, certainly. It has a pole and a zero. So it is deliberately implemented all-pass filter. By cascading all-pass filters, some uh, fancy things can be done in digital signal processing. Let me tell you at least something like that. So uh, they have their significance and uh, although they are all pass systems, it doesn't mean that they are not changing the angles. So they are incorporating some phase distortions to the system. They are just passing the magnitudes as they are, but the angle terms, they don't pass as they are. If the angles also pass as they are, then that would be an identity system. This is not an identity system, it's just an all pass system. As a matter of fact, the angle I do have a uh, term for that of h of j omega is equal to uh, theta 1 minus theta 2. Theta 1 is the angle of uh, the 0. Theta 2 is the angle of uh, the pole. And uh, theta 1 is equal to pi minus theta 2. They are also symmetric. These two angles have complementary. Theta 1 plus theta 2 is equal to pi, in other words. There, therefore, we can write it as uh, pi minus 2 theta 2, which is equivalent to saying pi minus arctangent uh, omega divided by A. So, as you see, with omega, the angle, the phase term changes. It is not a constant phase or a zero phase system. Okay. Now, these are uh, the examples that I have in my mind. Unfortunately, um, I don't know where you can find such an applet, but they may ex exist. Please use, try to use the search words like uh, Laplace plane applet animation or explain animations, applets, Java, such keywords. Please try to find a, a copy of such a, a tool where you can insert some poles and zeros. That would be quite beneficial for you. Um, now, I will continue with the promised uh, concept of uh, properties of the Laplace transform because it's the properties by which we will solve questions involving inverse Laplace transforms and forward Laplace transforms. As a matter of fact, your friend had uh, solved uh, the previous question. Can you find the inverse Laplace transform of that? 
by using a property, S times something corresponds to the derivative. That is one example, property, for example. So we are going to see that. Now. And as always, these properties are, of course, listed in the book. You have already uh, brought the, those properties, I guess, the second lecture. Uh, the first one is linearity. It may sound trivial to mention about this, but it's so important because without using linearity, you cannot scale a signal and scale the uh, Laplace transform with the same scale. Or you cannot combine the signals and you cannot combine the Laplace transforms uh, by addition simply without using the linearity property. That's an important property. So A times x1 of t plus B times x2 of t will have a Laplace transform. Let's indicate it with this calligraphic sort of L. Uh, is equal to A times x1 of S plus B times x2 of S. So that is the linearity property. But now uh, we come up with something quite different from the properties of the Fourier transform. The uh, properties must also govern the regions of convergences as well. What's happening to the regions of convergences when we add two signals? Their intersection is a good bet. And uh, for 99% of the cases, or even more than that, in fact, for 100% uh, of the cases, it is the intersection of these two regions of convergences, specifically for x1 and x2. But there are very exceptional situations where it may be greater than their intersection. So uh, the best way to uh, incorporate those exceptions is by saying region of convergence includes a set inclusion is here R1 intersection R2 it doesn't say much as you see what's the region of convergence it includes uh, R1 intersection R2 so it is not smaller than R1 intersection R2 but it may be greater than and it may be the universal set as well uh, and why is that the case why am I saying that? Let's see an example. x1 of s is equal to 1 over s plus 1. And x2 of s is equal to uh, 1 over s plus 1, s plus 2. Here the region of convergence is, uh, for the first one, real part of s is greater than minus 1 and for the second one it's again real part of S greater than minus 1 so they are both right hand sided <coughs> the question is this if you combine them in such a way that your new X of S is equal to X1 of S minus X2 of S a linear combination like this <coughs> This x of s, the new combined x of s, is expected to have a region of convergence like real part of s is greater than minus 1. It's to the right of minus 1. Let's subtract them first. Uh, that is equal to 1 over s plus 1 minus 1 over s plus 1 s plus 2 and suddenly you see it to be equal to uh, 1 over s plus 2 because the s plus 1 terms in the denominator just cancel there is a, an s plus 1 term in the denominator but we incorporate an s plus 1 term in the numerator with this combination and the new thing is 1 over s plus 2 and the region of convergence is real part of s since it's a combination of two right-hand side signals, it is a right-hand side signal, right to the pole. It's greater than minus 2. To the right of minus 2 is a set that is larger than to the right of minus 1. Minus 1 is 
here, minus 2 is here. To the right of minus 1 is here. To the right of minus 2 is greater than that. It includes to the right of minus 1. But it's a greater set. So, uh, although I'm telling it's something uh, like something magical, it's not something magical. You just have to be careful about pole zero cancellations. You may, by combinations or by doing something, you may incorporate some distinct zeros which may cancel some of the poles. And that pole may be a critical pole. It may be to the right or to the left of that pole. And now it is gone. It doesn't exist there anymore. So uh, you must be careful about the pole zero cancellations. And um, so what I would recommend is that this region of convergence equals R1 intersection R2 is nonsense. Just forget about it. Evaluate the new uh, Laplace transform, find the pole of it, and evaluate its region of convergence again. Again. You have to do it again. You will never be sure that it will be uh, the same as the previous, or the intersection as the previous, because of pole zero cancellations. In many other properties, I will say that it includes R1 intersection R2, which means nothing. Okay? It means you have to recalculate the poles, find the poles, and find the region of convergence. Okay. <coughs> now, another property is uh, shift in S domain. It uh, happens like this. X of T has a Laplace transform of capital X of S and the region of convergence is equal to R. A region, it may be a stripe, it may be some regions, whatever. Uh, then E to the S0 T times X of T will have a Laplace transform X of S minus S0. Now, what happens to the region of convergence? Uh, look at the case where the denominator has uh, something like S minus A. S minus A in the denominator has a pole at S is equal to A. And that defines the region of convergence boundary. Let's assume. Now, it's not S minus A anymore. It is S minus S0 minus A. Okay? So what is the new pole? The new pole is A plus S0. A plus S0 is the new pole. If S0 is real, A plus S0. If it is complex, A plus real part of S0 is the new pole. That new pole is now the boundary. So the boundary of uh, the region of convergence is shifted with respect to the real part of S0. As, and I again recommend that you just evaluate whatever that new pole is and locate the region of convergence by yourselves. But in the book, they do have uh, a representation for the region of convergence that I hate using. The, it says uh, region of convergence is equal to re this previous region shifted by the real part of S0. So this plus is a shift in the region. It's a regional shift. And does it mean anything to you? I'm not sure about that. It doesn't mean much to me. It's just that uh, the region of convergence boundaries are shifted by uh, the real part of S0. Understand it that way. But that is the notation that the book uses. So this is the shift in S domain. Uh, we can make some illustrations if you wish. For example, if the previous <coughs> region of convergence is from A to B, like this, the region of convergence, then now we have a new region of convergence like this. Uh, this is, uh, this point is S plus, sorry, uh, A plus real part of S0. 
this point is b plus real part of s0 and this is the new region of convergence it is just shifted towards right for example if real part of s0 is positive so that's the new region of convergence time scale is the new property <coughs> and the situation is like this if you have x of a times t if you multiply the time variable by a then the Laplace transform of this will be just like the Fourier transform 1 over magnitude a capital X of s over a but then what is the uh, region of convergence? No, it's not the same. Yes, exactly. Uh, the situation is like this. Suppose that in the denominator you used to have an S minus X, I will say, uh, no, no, X is not good. Lambda, let's say, okay, a new parameter in the denominator. Because I'm using A, I'm, I, I couldn't say S minus A. That would confuse the with the scale. Now it will be 1 over, uh, sorry, not 1 over necessarily, over something like this, S over A minus lambda. So the previous root of the denominator was lambda, now it is A times lambda. And therefore you have to make uh, the boundaries multiplied by A for the uh, region of convergence. If it was previously 3, and if A is uh, 2, for example, now the uh, root will not be at 3, it will be at 6. It is either to the right of that 6 or to the left of that 6, whatever it is. Um, th therefore, you have to re-evaluate the poles, which are the roots of the denominator. And the book has an awkward notation. It says region of convergence is equal to A times R. It is just the poles are multiplied by A, in other words. And then you have a new boundary. Depending on the value of A, it may be smaller, larger. It may be inverted, because A could be negative. It may be minus 0 0.5, which is quite confusing. Uh, so. That's the property that we have. The Laplace transform by itself is not a difficult property, as you see. It is similar to the Fourier transform properties. But the regions of convergences, we have to be <coughs> careful. And I always failed in the exams uh, while I was taking this uh, signal science systems course. Professor was asking uh, the, uh, a question regarding this uh, property and uh, I was trying to use the property formulas and I just couldn't do that and, and the time was gone I mean, we, we were running out of time so I felt pity that and I asked me a question myself a question why didn't I just find the new roots and then reevaluate the region of convergence that would be the best thing to do okay. so you have to do it that way I mean I recommend that you do it that way just reevaluate the root and reconsider the region of convergence again don't worry about this stupid property okay that's time scale conjugation or conjugate is another property x conjugate of t of course these properties are valid only for uh, complex signals if the signal is having some imaginary parts, which is not necessarily the case, we'll have a Laplace transform equal to capital X conjugate of S conjugate. What was the uh, Fourier transform property? Do you remember that? Minus. It was X capital X conjugate minus J omega. Isn't this the same? S conjugate is equal to minus J omega. Because sigma plus j omega is s, and its conjugate is sigma minus j omega. It only negates the frequency with a conjugation, overall conjugation term as well. So they are the same. And the region of convergence for this one, at least, is the same. It doesn't change. Because 
you are just conjugating the omegas. If there is a pole upwards, there is another pole downwards, or there is not, okay? Suppose we have a pole here, and this is the real axis. When you negate or conjugate it, it will come here. And the vertical position doesn't change. So it doesn't perturb the region of convergence. It may be f to the right of that pole or to the right of this pole. They are the same. It's vertically the same. The real parts didn't change. So conjugation doesn't change the region of convergence. Convolution. An important and a useful property is just like the Fourier property. If you convolve two time signals, then the Laplace transforms will be multiplied. Just like the Fourier transform. <coughs> and what about the region of convergence? Can you do you have a bet? Can you guess what the region of convergence is? No? It's uh, just like the first property. It includes R1 intersection R2. Uh, and so what should you uh, be careful about? You should be careful about pole zero cancellations in the multiplication uh, of X1 of S and X2 of S. If uh, X1 of S has a zero, at a position which is a pole at the uh, other uh, term which uh, belongs to x2 of s they cancel each other they, they, there may be cancellations of poles and zeros for example x1 of s is equal to s plus 1 over s plus 2 and x2 of s is equal to s plus 2 over s plus 1 they are just inverses of each other inverse systems and th this one has a region of convergence real part of S greater than minus 2. This one has real part of S greater than minus 1. <coughs> and when you multiply x1 of S and x2 of S, you will get a 1. And the region of convergence will be uh, the entire S plane. Because they will cancel everything. We don't have a 0. We don't have a pole. That's always possible. Differentiation. Or taking the derivative. We have already uh, used it. The time derivative signal has a Laplace transform of S times X of S. <coughs> How about the region of convergence? Any, guess what, what did you say? Same. Why? Uh, why we are multiplying by S? Yeah, we are just imposing. We are just imposing a zero at S is equal to zero. So if there is a pole at S is equal to zero. That may be cancelled, but it is the only case where uh, this may happen. You may just cancel a pole at s is equal to zero. So if your original x of s is something like this, uh, 1 over s squared pl plus s. So 1 over s parentheses s plus 1 in other words. Then that 1 over s <coughs> term will cancel. So yes, it is the same almost, always. Uh, or let's say, except uh, a pole cancellation at s is equal to zero. So you must only be careful about a pole at zero. If there is no pole at zero, it's the same. <coughs> Uh, the, there is another differentiation uh, property in the Laplace domain this time, and that is a headache. You have to be, uh, you have to understand why it's a headache. Minus t times x of t 
has a Laplace transform d by ds x of s. So uh, it, it also gives us an idea about the duality property. Look at that. If you consider that thing as a time signal, then its Laplace transform will be minus d by ds of that. So we have a duality property. This is similar to that. This is similar to that with the negation. So we do have a duality property. But the headache, at least for me, is um, to try to take a derivative with respect to a complex val parameter, valued parameter. ds. s is equal to sigma plus j omega. So we are not differentiating with respect to omega, or we are not differentiating with respect to sigma. We are differentiating with respect to sigma plus j omega. And I'm having difficulty in understanding what it may even look like. But at least it's a polynomial, we know it, right? 1 over s plus a, for example. And of course, with respect to s, we can differentiate 1 over s plus a. There's no problem about the implementation. I'm OK with the implementation. I'm not OK with what it means when you take the derivative in the Laplace domain. In the time domain, what is a derivative? It gives you the gradient, the slope. Uh, x of s is a surface. So how do you take the derivative? How do you find the gradient? Do we have a directional gradient? It's a surface then. x of s is a surface, by the way. What kind of a derivative are we thinking of? This s-plane uh, that we have previously shown, like this, for example, is not, uh, this representation is not giving you all the things. It is giving you only uh, some uh, data at certain points. For example, at this point, this is a surface, in other words, that we cannot draw using uh, this kind of a pencil. You must look at it a little bit tilted. It's a surface. A Laplace plane is a surface, which goes to infinity at these points. So there are two, uh, think of it like a, a rubber, okay, a balloon rubber, stretched balloon rubber, and pinch it from a point, pinch it from another point, and extend it to infinity. These two points behave like that. So it's like a cake, a surface that goes to infinity at some points. What are the zeros? Zeros are the points where you press the surface with your finger and uh, bring it down to zero level. It's easier to p uh, than pinching it towards infinity. Just press down to zero. They are the zeros. So it's a surface. It's like a cake. And this uh, magnitude of h of j omega thing is uh, the slice of a cake. You cut that surface cake from here, cut it, and look at the profile. <coughs> the cutting profile. That cutting profile is magnitude of h of j omega. But we have a surface like this. So in that surface, how do we take a derivative? <coughs> is a conceptually difficult thing. <coughs> but uh, mathematically it's easy. I mean, you can always take uh, a function of s and take the derivative of it. There's no difficulty in that. Ah, OK. And since it's quite easy, I didn't mention about that. The region of convergence, when you take the derivative with respect to S, usually doesn't change again. Because what is the derivative of 1 over S plus A? Let's think of a first order. Let me give you an example from that. What's the derivative of that? It is something over S plus A squared. So you used to have a pole at A, uh, or minus A, and now you have two poles at the same position, at precisely the same position. You're just increasing the number of poles by taking the derivative. But the positions of the poles don't change. You're incorporating extra, another extra pole to a, a pole position which you, uh, already existed there. So uh, it doesn't change or move the poles. It's just uh, fortifying 
the, the poles, <laughs> making them strong. Ah. Well, the time is already uh, okay. Uh, we will have a few more properties and we will see a few more examples too. So let's leave it to next week's lecture uh, about them. We can stop at this point and we will continue next week.